some of you thought you punch. Oh, yeah, with the, uh, yeah. yeah. I tell you, I, I put them in there too. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. So you, you can slip it in there because sometimes it's like, it's not like yeah. it. And it can't, I feel some more power in this one. All right, whatever you want to do, so I'm just going to throw like eight, ten punch combos and back off. You ready? Yeah. heels of your, your book sign yesterday at Fantini's restaurant. Fantini's, yes. Yeah, Fantini's, yeah, which is a phenomenal, phenomenal restaurant, phenomenal event packed. We had a, a yes. whole bunch of people there. It was good to, to, to see you, question and answer, you, you, you know, signing books and, and, and autographs and whatnot. How does that make you feel? I mean, after, well, you, you know, know it's, it's humbling. Yeah. Uh, when people get to know my story, where I came from, being involved in my life, it was, uh, to be able to come back and be welcomed that way, it's a good feeling. Because I didn't start out in life that way. Mm -hmm. I was an athlete, martial artist, as you know, and uh, I studied under Lou Neglia, mm -hmm. four-time champion, yeah. and uh, it's humbling. Yeah, and Lou Neglia, of course, is, is uh, out of lines a long time. I've written as a fight promoter, ring mm -hmm. of combat. Actually, there's more UFC fighters, that more fighters that signed to the UFC, his organization, I think, than just about any other organization out there. And Negley is the real deal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, he proved himself in the ring several yeah. times, and uh, he's great uh, sensei. Yeah. And when I started teaching, I used a lot of his theories, a lot of his attitude. Uh, I tried to take bits and pieces after that, because as I got to Florida later on, I trained with Thunder. Uh, the Greg Wilson, mm -hmm. Donnie Hare, who may rest in peace, Phil Collins, Dave DeQua uh, DeQualo. They were all uh, trainers in my previous gym and uh, fitness center and dojo. So we had a, I've been around phenomenal fighters. And obviously fitness and martial arts is, is a way of life. It's, it's I could tell, right. and, 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 I, and I'm on that, that plane as well, where it's a way of life, mind, body, spirit, exercise. Yes. yes. I'm going to tell you a quick story, I, because that's a great point. Hasn't, it was not set up. Not too many people know this, but I'm clear for many, many weeks. I've been vaccinated, but I did have the COVID. Okay? Uh, this is like an exclusive. Right? And because, and I'm still having trouble, a little bit of trouble getting my lung capacity back, as you can see. Uh, but when I got it, because of my condition, I started feeling the inklings on Sunday night. Got to my pharmacist Monday, gave me the proper medication, whatever he. I trust my pharmacist a lot. I was broke my fever Tuesday. The whole thing took 48 hours. I was better. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of horror stories too. But conditioning and uh, taking a proactive. Uh, position against not only COVID, anything, any other health. So it all ties together. There's nothing like a uh, martial art or fighters routine. Best thing for anybody. So. Yeah, it's 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 a, a, a admirable uh, to see in such great shape. Uh, well, thank you. I'm not at my best right now, but I appreciate that. Yeah, yes. and, and still 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 fighting, still fighting. I think if more Americans would, would do that, we'd have less of, less problems with COVID. And, and yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, getting the weight under control, very important, you know, because then diabetes and the heart problems come with that. And, and if you then wind up with a COVID situation, you're in a fight of your life, you know. So we, we, be proactive, it's very important. 
your vitamins too. There's other things help. You got to eat right. Uh, and again, and that all ties into fitness and martial arts. And so it's all good, all good stuff. Well, I'm proud. I got a copy of Larry's book, and, and I'm, I'm starting to read it, The Life. And uh, folks, I'm telling you right now, uh, you have to get Larry's book, The Life, uh, so you can read the details about, you know, uh, what happened, uh, his his amazing story, and whatnot, delving into the criminal underworld, uh, and whatnot. And I just have to ask you, just like, you know, beforehand, just just out of personal curiosity, I mean, you know, we see people like John Gotti um, uh, uh, Jr. And, and other other individuals that are constantly telling the stories because so many people are interested. So many people are interested in this. Do you ever get tired of, 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 of just going down down memory lane? Well, you know, uh, I think it's a great question. I don't get tired of it because I think there is a message in there. Not that, and I'm very strong about making it clear that I don't have the proper credentials. I did at one point. I lost it. When I went in the, in the direction I went, to try to preach to kids right. not to get into it. Stay away from that life. Okay. But through my teaching martial arts again, and just what I've done in this area, Donnie Hare and Phil Collins and some of the names I mentioned, Donnie Wilson, they promoted me to second degree. Not because I'm still fighting or anything like that, just what I did for the area and all the young students we had come in. But my, my, my message is, you don't need that lifestyle, that right. criminal lifestyle, right. to be respected yeah. or to uh, earn a good living. There's better ways to do it. Uh, and like I said, I'm doing better now. I said it in my speech last night, I'm doing better now than ever. You know, it has nothing to do with my book because I just, you know, I, I'm still promoting that. It's the things I worked hard on that have made me a uh, better person today. Just, you know, the, the gist of it is you were working as a delivery boy and went to deliver groceries to a house and ended up having an affair with the women that you delivered groceries to who was right. older. Uh, I, I know that, you know, you, you went over this, but how did that happen? Because it sounds like a well, fantasy come true for a young man. It, it, it was. Uh, it was. Uh, my father, may rest in peace, even said he doesn't know if he could have turned that uh, situation out. You know, he's a lieutenant for 25 years in the fire department, great man. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, you know, at that age, you're naive, you're young, and you don't think you're right ahead all the time. You know, so, and it's, uh, the, 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 and it lasted almost 10 years. So it was true feelings. It wasn't just a fling type of thing. Uh, and, you know, we, uh, it, it took me in levels of things I never thought of imaginable, especially in the life. And it gets even crazier because the woman, it turns out, was the wife of Gregory the Grim Reaper Scarfa. Uh, and I'm scared of reading about this guy. Like if you, I've seen documentaries on this guy. And, uh, he, he was a real, real uh, terrifying individual. But you assumed he was a businessman. Well, at the beginning, yeah. Based on what she had said, he traveled a lot. He was uh, away on business a lot. So, again, a, a young, 17, naive kid will believe all that. Uh, you know, again, if, if, if that same circumstance came up, 10, 15, 10 later, you know, I wouldn't believe all of it. You know, you're a little bit more polished, you, you, you're, you're more, you, you learn more about life, and you say, no, it's not it enough. But being 17, I didn't care if it ended up. You know, I wasn't even thinking about that. So yeah, we, uh, but ultimately he, he sat me down and he explained to me that he was okay with the situation. And in hindsight, I know why now. Because he had well, several other wives that he had to, juggle his life around, so I, I helped him out and made his life easier. How did you find out who he was? Well, she told me eventually. She told me, uh, you know, uh, after I met him and, and explained, but, you know, we have to keep the super secret, which we did, but we did start taking chances. You know, I got paranoid, I was very you know, whole thing. Uh, that's when she told him about it. So, yeah, and, and so you had an idea how dangerous he was and how fair he was. Not at that point because okay. uh, I, I wasn't a historian. I wasn't went around with guys. I did have an uncle out uh, who uh, our friend met, met, met his son Joe, my cousin. And, you know, uh, but to really understand violence and uh, murderous ways, you have to be much closer. And as I got closer, as a few years went on, that's when I learned. How dangerous it is. The FBI believes that Scarpa may have been involved with 120 murders, which is even hard to fill. Well, do, do you think that figure could be accurate? It's it's probably low. Well, uh, he told me early on 
you know, like early on, I mean, at five, six, seven years after I was with him, I was probably 25, he told me, stop counting at 50. Okay, stop counting. Okay, I know of 25 myself. With him. You know, not that I was on everyone, but I was somehow part of planning or I knew it or I picked him up afterwards. And like I said at the speech, I bought a shovel, I a guy a flat. There's all different levels. Ultimately, when the war came, uh, I, I was involved in uh, four murders with him where I was a shooter. Yeah. So, you know, uh, the FBI says 120, that's what they know about. It's guaranteed several more that they don't know about. And uh, I also know that he did a few that were not on record. We didn't even oh. tell the family. So, there's, uh, my guess is the 200 area, my guess. Yeah, because uh, you, you spoke about this last night, just uh, uh, you know, the turmoil, the, the different factions, uh, you know, between between the families right. and, and whatnot. And, you know, I mean, you were still very young at this time, and you know, it's almost commendable that you didn't run away because I think a lot of people at that, that situation, once they realize, would probably run away. Well, yes, and I was advised to do that by my uncle Albert, my father. Uh, even though my father didn't really know exactly how deep I was, my uncle Albert started understanding. But in that life, now I was there around 10 years. Okay, I'm 28 when this war starts, and loyalty is everything, and, and trust. So he told me that I am his most closest, loyalist friend he has ever had. You know how that touched me? I could never turn on this guy. This is how I felt. And uh, my, he didn't want anybody else. Guys that were around him longer than me weren't allowed around him. He was afraid somebody's going to turn on him. Mm -hmm. But me and my best friend Jimmy, he, he, he trusted 100% because he knew how many Jimmy that we were. So I never thought about it. And as the war was raging on, the thing that I worry about in my own head most and maybe it's part of my stuff, not to have fear, not to, you know, just roll with the punches, so to speak. There were bullets pinging around me. There was a situation where we were in a car, and we knew we could never take our life off our surroundings. We had to go meet friends in a diner. We come out to the car, the three of us, me, Jimmy, and Greg, get in the car. Just as soon as the door shut, there's two rows of guys walking on each side of the car. None of us panicked. None of us grabbed our guns. Jimmy didn't start the car to try to run away. We sat there, resigned to die. I thought mm. we were done. Turns out, there's a funny ending. They all had bowling bags in their hand. They were a bowling team coming out of the diner. <laughs> and they were going to the car behind us. But we didn't know that till after there was no shots fired and we looked down and said, oh my God. But from that minute on, we never, Jimmy had that mirror, Greg had that mirror, I was looking around, I had a scanner, we were on top, we said, never, that, let that be a lesson of us. Those guys could kill us right here. But what scared me most of all was that we got our guard down. I wasn't afraid to die. Mm. And Jimmy said the same thing afterwards. He says, "Isn't that that's the scary?" Yeah. yeah it's, it's so we got so desensitized. Yeah. We got so into this life, the life, the style that you know, we, we didn't. We, we just the fear was gone. It was, uh, you know. And you talked about style. this last night, and I've seen this on YouTube where the mafia slowly develops a person into, into the killing process. Right. It's almost like you call it grooming, right? Where you know they, they started off talking about a person's sense of justice, and, and they send you to, along to deal with someone who, who may have uh, you know done something, and then it just gets progressively worse. And worse. Very true. It, you know, in the, the, the movies will show you you know guy killing his best friend on his first date, right? Not likely to happen because it, it, they, if they came to me when I was 21 to kill my best friend Jimmy, I'm going to tell Jimmy get out of town. I'm not that loyal yet. Family. As time goes on, you owe them, and they do favors for you. Then it's easy to have them tell you to kill anybody, you know. Which is, I was lucky enough to have that happen. Uh, but they do. They, 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 the first thing they do is find a trait in you yeah, that they want you in with them. Typically, it's a good family, somewhat a decent education. Uh, they don't want thugs. They don't want these swindlers and guys that hang out in the street robbing. Like I answered one of the questions last night, those guys came to us. That 
little petty whatever will go rob his grandfather's Rolex and come and sell it to us for 500 bucks because he needs 500 dollars. Okay, then he'll want to hang around and say, see, I get this stuff, and they try to work them, they're never going to get anywhere. Okay, you get somewhere with loyalty, earning, and then ultimately showing you, you can take, you can do what you're asked to do. It's a slow process. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, somebody once said, I would, would have mentioned his name, but we're not very tight anymore, said, and, and he said it well, that there are racketeers and there are killers that make it to the top. If you're a racketeer and you're a big earner, you'll move up. If you're a killer, you'll move up. Greg was bald. Mm. That's not me saying it. This was uh, a heavyweight from yeah. his family saying it. Uh, and he also said that Greg's whole crew, now I don't mean the hangers on, the guys that got in his inner circle, there's probably a dozen of us that were all racketeers and ultimately killers also. Yeah, and that brings me to the next question. I don't want to fixate on murders, but there was, was this is just such a big part of organized crime. Um, there was one thing in particular I want to ask you about that I read in the interview. Describing the hit you carried out, uh, you said, I aimed right behind his ear. I yep. saw his whole face fly off, including his nose, yep. and, and hit the wind, windshield. It was chilling. Now, obviously, that, that's very, very chilling to even read out loud yes. and to do alone, actually. How, how did you rationalize that sort of balance to well, yourself? I'll, I'll tell you, you know, you picked that one. It was the one of two that got really bloody at the end. Uh, but this guy, uh, Nicky Black, the guy you're talking about, he was a heavyweight on the arena side. Powerful man. Council, yeah. That's like number two and a half, I'll say. Because he's right there with the other boss. Actually, it's a better position to have. But uh, He sends a message through my Uncle Albert, who I mentioned, mm -hmm. that was under him. My uncle was under him in the structure. That if I don't come over, and they called me Butchie at the time, if Butchie doesn't come over our side, I'm going to kill him. So, needless to say, my uncle got that message to me as well as some other people that were in his club that wanted to remain our friends because they knew we may win. Uh, they got a message to us. So he became our number one target. If he's that day, he's done for me, he became a Greg was as mad as I was here and there, probably more mad. Somehow, what it was, I hate to use this divine intervention, it was somebody's orchestrating our lives from somebody. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't my time, thank God. He pops up on the, in the area where we were looking for him. And uh, we wanted him. So, yeah, I, I, I pulled up and I was going home to get this guy. It was really the life and death situation. I put up my bandana, I had a baseball hat on and sunglasses. I reached out and yeah, I got real close to him and I'm surprised he didn't turn and look. But what I believe happened was he was set up like uh, uh, off duty cops or cop doing surveillance. He had, you know, camera, uh, camera in the window, coffee cup in the window. We looked like cops, I think. I think he thought we were cops. Mm -hmm. up on him to question him or arrest him because he got tight behind the wheel and he never looked, never saw the problem. And it was, it was pretty, pretty gruesome, but you know, again, uh, if he would, if the, it was the other way around, he would have had no mercy on me. Yeah. He said it and he should have kept his mouth shut and stayed in the back of Once he said that, he put himself on the call number one You know, there's something about behavior in the life. You're supposed to behave a certain way, and you don't tell a godfather that you're going to kill his godson. That's not that's not the way to life. Yeah. Yeah. So he got pretty much what he had to do. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, I, and there's certain times, you know, I can go from that little bit of cold part of this. I know that yeah. sounds cold, but you got to live it. you got to be you got to be the target. I was the threat of this man. He was coming to kill me. It's horrible to discuss. But previous to the war, when I talk about things, I get choked up, you know? And it's not an act. I, I don't like the, the, the road that took me to the war, you know? But yeah. once you're in it, there's not much you can do. Yeah, your, your perspective has changed. I mean, uh, it certainly has changed, I think, you know, when, when, with your decision when you cooperated with, with the authorities. Mm -hmm. uh, how hard was that on a personal level? I mean, was it worse? When the prosecution you were cooperating with fell apart? Well, not really. I, you know, it, it's, it becomes, I don't want to say a business decision, but a life, a fork in the road. And I was extended 
what I, not only say an olive branch, but what they extended to me was an L. Okay, because this was becoming very public. The FBI themselves needed to know as much as they can about this alleged corrupt agent. Okay, they had their own agents that knew. They had incredible, uh, in my book I tell all about the, the things that led to this guy. Okay, and we had, you know, uh, uh, one example was my boss wanted to get uh, uh, one of the heavyweights on the other side, Wilder Bocatola, by dressing as FBI agents. Now, not me and him, but Billy Lewis. But have some of our guys get in cheaper suits and just walk up. And, so I said, yeah, he's going to have a badge and credentials. He tells me, don't worry, I can get it. That's a small piece of evidence. We had the, uh, we had the private, we had the private code frequency that the task force was using with the FBI. So we're listening to them. Where did we get that from? They know where we got it. Uh, probably the biggest piece of evidence was at the trial that this guy wound up being, one of the agents, the subordinates, had gotten an address of Victor Wing. That was the group de Graf, who the Victor was over. Okay? He finds an address and he the subordinate hands it to the supervisor, who was the alleged corrupt guy. At the time, it wasn't known. He hands him this address. Somehow or another, that address, now those two guys, the only two that have it, winds up in Greg Scarpa's pocket. <laughs> and it's a wrong address. It has, no, there's no house on that lot. So what are the odds of this subordinate handing his boss a wrong address, and we get the same exact wrong address? So there was things like that, and there was a parade of witnesses. Greg Jr. came in, uh, 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 Carmine Sessa, the counsel on our side came in, and the judge said he knew he was guilty. He said, but you're lucky you get off on a technicality, and at the very least, something I said last night, the FBI mishandles and grossly, grossly mishandles the use of witnesses, and they'll take anybody and yeah. just any, you know, uh, and he made it clear that they, they need to be reprimanded and change their ways. Well, one thing that came up last night, this is a very, very good, good point, is that most people believe if you cross the mafia, you're targeted for assassination. But we've seen several high-profile former mobsters testify against their associates without being one. Why is it that these high-profile cases, including your suit, not to result in severe consequences from moving as well? Well, let's, let's think about that. A lot of times it's the bosses themselves that are roughly on the lower level guys, like Gas Pipe, Sammy the Bull. These guys were bosses. Al Diarco, Matty the Horse. It goes on and on and on. So they shouldn't be able to give up underlings. It really should be the other way around, if anything. Not that that's right either. They shouldn't, they should have to build evidence and not convict guys to life just on a say so. That's my opinion. It's opinion of a lot of people. You know, uh, but if you if you do, they, they're probably learning their lesson. The murders just bring life sentences, so they're getting tired of of, of facing the situation. Uh, and also, if you kill a witness, I'm pretty sure it's a death penalty. You're going to get a death penalty, a conviction. So there's a lot of deterrence, and I believe the mob today is is pulling back on killing for that reason. And I was going to answer a guy last night, but I, it was yeah. in a restaurant. I would, if I was in charge and you had to uh, uh, set somebody straight or, you know, penalize them for something, I would give them a beating, okay? It's not murder. You're not facing life. Now, if the guy shows up again when he's out of the hospital a month later, you beat him up again. You just keep beating him up until he leaves. And then it's, you got him out of the way without facing that. Now that being, again, that's the old school of thinking, and if I, if I was in the I'm not saying that's a good thing and I want to go back to that. Yeah. But if those guys are out there doing it and they want to survive, stop the killing. So in that regard, Larry, uh, yeah. just listening to this, would it be logical that there'd be guys that would be lying and committing perjury to save themselves? Absolutely, absolutely. If, uh, and then if you get a corrupt prosecutor, and I'm never going to mention names because uh, it wouldn't be a good thing for me, but they know who they are. Mm. They have to live with it themselves, but there are prosecutors that will allow you oh, of course. And, and coach you. Uh, not all. Yeah. I, run it, I mean, there were some that were, but you know, oh, unfortunately, my case has a terrible stink to it. Yeah. Uh, based on Greg and the agent and some prosecutors that were. But let, let's get real. A lot of prosecutors, they make their bones on these cases. Yeah. 
and you're dealing with guys that are trying to save themselves. Right. So it's the yeah. perfect storm for perjury. Well, and let me ask you this. Let me ask you this question. A lot of positions you have to put in 20 years, like a fire department, a civil servant. If you're a prosecutor, you can work for four or five years, then jump fence, and now start charging 200,000 a case. I don't think that's worse than me selling a book, if you ask me. And I'm going to tell you why. These prosecutors, when they're up there, they're saying, and use me, Larry Mazet is reformed. He's a good guy now. He's telling the truth. He's doing a heroic thing. They go on and on and on. Five years later, that same prosecutor is saying, Larry Mazet is trying to help himself. He's a liar. You can't believe him. He's facing life. So it's a conflict of interest. They should not be allowed to go from prosecution and jump the fence. Maybe 20 years later, when all the cases are different, and there's different witnesses, and there's different criminals, but there were guys that were prosecutors, and now two years later, they're representing the guys that prosecuted, they, or, or the guys in the same circle. Our judge took himself off our case, you know what? It's in my book. He said, I've been on so many Colombo cases that I feel like an honorary member. <laughs> he says, and you can't get a fair trial with me. He said, I think you will kill me. I'm recusing, yeah. I'm recusing myself. And he took himself off, and then we wound up with the one I mentioned last night that uh, made that ruling earlier on about the fire department, and then 10 years later, he sentences me. So. Why do you think you were able to survive these brutal mob wars and everything else happens? I mean, is there something about you as a person, an element of luck? Or? Well, I, I'm not going to say luck at all. Uh, you know, again, in that life, there's a lot of, uh, some people are like this, there's a lot of folks. They dropped out of school. They're petty thieves, they, they're drug users. They're not that smart. So getting above them and distancing from them and, and being able to outsmart and outmaneuver them is not a big deal. But once I moved up, there were equally as smart guys. Now it became who was more treacherous, who was more devious, who was ready to kill faster. It's a whole different world. So I think I, I survived it by balancing nerve and brains. A lot of guys that get killed, they have more nerve than brains. They don't have respect. They're not loyal. I was smart enough to know where I could make my moves, where I had my battles. It's all its all just a big business, and it's, uh, it's like politics. You know, we could, I would never get into that last night. I won't get into it now, but you can argue stuff back and forth, and people just don't agree on things, no matter how much sense you think you make it. Well, Larry, what, how do you define politics? <laughs> you love this. It's from an old word, I believe it's Latin. Poly, P-O-L-I meaning many. Ticks, blood-sucking insects. <laughs> Politics. Yeah. Okay, many uh, blood-sucking insects. Most people would agree with that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a, we, as a matter of fact, we were our own government. And that's something that that agent told my boss. That's what we're after. We want to break down your government. We don't care if there's a Shylock on one corner, a bookmaker on the other corner. We're not going to allow structure. Where is it? There's course. an old there's an old saying, Larry. Uh, never outshine the master. And I think our government views themselves as our master, which is so antithetical to what we're supposed to be yeah. as well, a country. It's getting out of control. It's getting yeah. out of control. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Trying to impose it, their will on us in every possible yeah. way. Uh, but I, I don't think it's going to happen. I think yeah. there's enough strong-willed people to keep. Well, what do you What do you think of that of that quote in conjunction with this? Never outshine the master. Like you said, if you become too powerful, it doesn't matter if it's the mob, you know, if it's any organization. What do they say about like in martial arts? I don't think it's really really true, but it was something that was said that the master will never teach you everything. Yeah. Because then you'll be better than him. You I, be, I had so old, sort of like that. I had an old quote that I used in a in a teacher student match. I taught you everything you know, but not everything I know. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. I've heard something like that. Yeah. yeah, it's true, very true. We've been interviewing uh, many uh, people connected to organized crime. Matthew and I. We have a new uh, podcast called mm -hmm. Mob Chats, which we're so excited about. One of which we did a press conference recently was with John Alight. Uh, uh, is Alight somebody you've crossed paths with before? You know, it's funny, I never met him in the street. Uh, I knew of him. Uh, at that time, I knew he was tight with John Jr. Mm -hmm. So you would know that, just like people knew me because I was tight with Greg. Yeah. They would know Greg before me. 
Uh, I met Johnny later on, uh, you know, uh, afterwards, after we all had our problems, we were back out in the free world and we were trying to move in a better direction. And I happen to like the guy. I think he's, uh, he had, he's more on that path of advocating to help kids. That's what got him on this path. And I believe, I believe he means that. Uh, and like I said, I, I'm not against that. I just have my, my different way of presenting that case. Uh, but I like John a lot. I, I, I don't. I think you know they, they talk about they try to make him some kind of lie as some of these stupid podcasts that are out there. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't think he has to lie, especially when you 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 came clean and you're moving on with your life. Uh, some of these guys that are calling him a liar to me are disgruntled. Uh, they were losers back then, and they're still losers. They can't they can't find their way in life without bringing somebody down. It's like the drowning victim right. that will bring you down with him instead of accepting your help. Sure. And I put messages out there to this day, because they try to with me, but I ignore them. I, I mean, I have a, a reputation and I have documentation that uh, people slandering me, they can't, they, they could never overcome what I had, proof that I had. So no. I don't engage in the arguments. But I will tell them this, because I'll never take the low road. I'm on the high road. And I said, I'll say it again, if they learn to behave right and reach out to me, I'll do anything I can do to help them. I do that for friends and people that were once friends, uh, I don't think what they're doing is smart. It's, uh, so, it, it so Larry, nobody anyway. So Larry, in, in backtracking to what Bob said, uh, we did this press conference with, with John and, and, and actually started it when I was at your house, when I, when I mentioned uh, Phil Baroni right, and you John. Want to do some yeah, yeah. yeah, so that, there's such an incredible story there. Just to give the Reader's Digest version, uh, John's partner, Johnny Alight's partner, in uh, bookmaking, uh, in, in loan sharking business, was a, a gentleman named Phil Baroni. Phil Baroni was a gold star detective that was also working with the Gambino family. He was the one who gave me that great quote years ago, if you want to be a gangster, the best thing to do is have a badge. Yeah. So we had that mutual friend, but I managed Phil Baroni's son for years, who's the fighter, UFC pride fighter. I knew the stories about Phil Baroni, the New York badass Phil mm -hmm. Baroni. I knew his stories with his father, I knew he was involved in, in the life to a degree. I also knew the story when he was wrestling at Hofstra, when he was stabbed up in the back of the head and was moved to Michigan. So, stuff we never talked about. The irony of this. Let's talk about the irony of this, but let's also talk about the point of that press conference was Gotti the Third is fighting, the Teflon Don's grandson. The average fight fan, Bob, they don't know he's fighting. Nope, right. They're doing nothing to promote this young man. He's got the name. I he's want to put that fight together mm -hmm. between the New York badass. The, the history, the backstory right. is tremendous. They're the same, same weight class. Mm -hmm. Phil is an older man now. Phil's right. almost 50 now. This young man is in his prime. Right. Patching of the torch fight. I want to get this fight together. I'm talking yeah. with the management for Gotti the Third. They want it to happen. You know what's stopping it? John A. Gotti. John Gotti Jr. Do you care to speak on, at this I at all? I, I, I'll just give my opinion. Yeah. Uh, I have no facts here. I don't really haven't been in contact with him. Uh, I think, first of all, I think it's a win-win. If yeah. his son is being promoted in this, it, it's like any other walk of life. You need Rick. You need a. Uh, it's who you know. Yeah. You know, and he's got the name. He's got this situation come up. Why not do it? Yeah. You know, why not? I don't know what uh, Junior's answer that would be, but my question is, why not? You know, Neither do I. Win, win. We're talking about the this son. kid, is a, and he's yeah. supposed to be pretty yeah, good. He's, yeah, he's a prospect. He's right. Good. So there you go. I'm going to tell you, Bob thinks, and I'm not going to say because I represent Phil. Bob thinks that that the third will beat Phil at this point. No doubt. About that. Yeah. He, you know, he, Phil's he's an older man. And, you know, Sammy the Bull was angry about this, saying, you know, leave his name out of your mouth. This is a professional MMA fighter who has six fights. He's yeah. supposed to fight uh, on the UFC yeah. Fight Pass. And so this is Let me speak to that, because he talked about what our press conference. Yeah. What Sammy the Bull said was ridiculous. He said that we were putting Gotti's family into it. This kid is a professional fighter. Yeah. We're trying to get his name out and there. Actually help him. And, yeah, and help him. Yeah. yeah. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. You know, again, everybody has their motives. I guess Sammy and Johnny are still going at it. Uh, yeah. And I think he came out with some statement about the rules and this is in Cosa Nostra. We're not in Cosa Nostra anymore. Exactly. We all signed out, including Sammy. 
So you know, he shouldn't be talking that way. That's a good point. And you know, you have rules that you want to say, yeah, he's right, you don't bring families in, but... But they're doing yeah. it. The, the right. Gottis are doing it. They're bringing right. Daylight's right. family in. Yeah. Don't, again, we're forgetting all the other rules. Yeah. Every other rule is broken, that's okay. Now yeah. you want to focus on this one rule that is, you know, and he's not even breaking the rule. John Jr., this kid Johnny is a fighter. Is that exactly. A yeah. He's yeah. Gotti the third, he goes by. He's yeah. a fighter. Yeah. He, should, yeah. he should be coming out saying, make it happen. Yeah. And five years ago, just yeah. to close this out, five years ago, Gotti the third, mm -hmm. In an interview, said called out Phil Baroni, and he talked about the past history with the family. He wanted to fight him. It's the it's his father that's standing in the way of this yeah. fight. Now, now uh, this is a, a, not to be humorous, but I know Johnny A. Uh, a like he said they could put on a pay per view event him and John Jr. Yeah. That's what they wanted to, to box been, each you know, other. And, yeah, you know, listen, at, at this stage of the game, I don't think anybody has the wind to go eight, nine, 10 rounds. So it's probably not gonna be that long. You use 16 ounce yeah. gloves yeah. and you make it, you know, and you like a tough there, man. John's out there yeah. making money in yeah. documentaries. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So he's breaking the rule. He's yeah. not really supposed to be yeah. doing that. Yeah. I got no problem with it, I'm just saying. Yeah, but I, 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 I could see John Jr. Yeah. John Jr. saying, no, I don't want to do that because you were, we're, we're helping a -Line. Okay, right. that's almost, under, we could uh, argue about that. But this is, this you is heard a professor on the fight. Yeah, exactly. You heard his son. And, he's, and his, fight, his yeah. son is not doing anything. He hasn't fought in two or three years. And it's it's wasted time. It's wasted. Yeah. It's at wasted some point, time. you know, like anything else, yeah. you're not just getting your ears boxed in for free. Yeah. You want to start earning, making a yeah. living yeah. doing it. So yeah. the only way is to get a, a promotion fight like that. You know, yeah. pay per view or or where ESPN or somebody yeah. Yeah. say, hey, we'll front you this much. Get that get, get that might happen. Well, Larry, I'm going to wrap it up on my okay. end, and uh, I, I just want to uh, close it by asking you. Uh, Few things. Number one, if it is possible, can can somebody sum up your life as far as the lessons and what people should learn from your life? Well, you know, I guess I said it numerous times. The, the most important thing is young kids think that is a respectful, loyal, honorable way of life. It's not. There's no honor in that life. It's, it's treachery and backstabbing. I'm not just when I say that, but I can't uh, describe it any other way. And you do not need it to get respect. You can earn respect uh, being a man, standing up for what's right. Uh, you know, work hard, go to school, like I was told I should do by my father. If I would have listened, I would have been a fire chief today. You know, and been respected and earned a good living. So you don't need that life. That's the easy way out. And it turns out to be a wrong way out because there's only a few endings and they're not happy. Well, let's remind everybody to get the book, The Life, um, that, that's available now in yeah. paperback. Uh, will it ever become uh, uh, available in the audio form? Well, yes. Okay, yeah. Actually, you know, I put a lot of things on hold because we are working on this, uh, the, the 